We'll get ready to start in one minute. Okay, let's begin. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Claire Fenelo. I'm the Executive Director at EVCOM. Uh, welcome to you all to this webinar on movement after Brexit. Um, now, I know, having spoken to many of our members over the last couple of months particularly, that this is uh, an issue that is causing uh, a lot of uh, pain and heartache and cost and aggravation and and I think just because um, particularly I think because of the pandemic um, I, I think a lot of people because there was not a lot of work going on um, it didn't seem so uh, pressing but of course now everyone's trying to hit the ground running and everyone's motoring and trying to start uh, go full speed ahead it, it, it really is starting to cause um, some problems so we hope that this will be um, one of several webinars that we have um, throughout the year uh, but it did seem that the issue around travel was was, was causing the most immediate issues so this afternoon, we have a panel of speakers that I'm uh, um, trusting and uh, that they will be able to talk about some of their experiences and also address some of your concerns and, and help and provide some resources and pointers and, 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 and just give you some uh, helpful tips as to uh, what you should be looking out for. Uh, before we begin, could I just um, suggest that if we, what we're going to try and do is answer questions in the moment, so as they come through, uh, related to the topics that we're talking about. So um, could you put your questions, please, in the chat box? And then that means that myself and all of the speaker panel will see those. Um, I do need to stop messages coming in. Um, um, and then that way uh, we, we can answer the questions in real time. Um, the webinar is being recorded and will be on our website uh, as of tomorrow lunchtime. Um, and there will also be the list of resources and any helpful websites and um, pointers that we come up with will also be on our website. So what I'm going to ask the panel to do, um, we have a, 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 a try to have a selection of people who are practical uh, on the ground experience and, and those who are experts in their field. So we're going to start, if I could go around the panel and ask them to introduce themselves. If we start with uh, Jigna, please, could you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jigna Palmer. I work at Bronze Creative as Senior Production Manager. And my role is effectively trying to get my crew and equipment across to Europe uh, for any shoots and events that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if we could go over to um, Samar now, please. Hi, I'm Samar Shams. I'm an immigration and global mobility partner based at Spencer West in Moorgate, London. And I help uh, businesses access the talent that they need, I help people live and work where they want. Um, I've been helping a number of um, events industry uh, companies with moving people to and around Europe. Thank you very much, Samar. And then um, if we could go to Rob Booth, please. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Rob here. Um, I'm from the Institute of Export and International Trade. Uh, we're a membership organization and we work with companies who are trying to, to sell their goods overseas and bring in materials into the UK. So we help them work through the uh, evolving requirements that we've seen since last year, and also look at some of the opportunities to uh, optimize those trade flows as well. Uh, and we also offer support to individuals studying for their professional qualifications in international trade as well. Thanks, Rob. And then over to Ashard, who is from the same um, Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Arshad Dadaboy. I'm also a uh, 
a consultant here, a trade and custom specialist at the Institute of Export, working alongside Rob. And as Rob has explained, um, we uh, we support businesses. We're a membership organization on international trade and uh, finance related matters. Thank you. Thank you, Arshad. And, and just a note for further reference, we are hoping to um, follow up with um, some more work with the Institute of, of Export and hope to be running a session directly with them alone later on in the year ab about international trade. Just to flag up. So that's coming soon. OK, right. So shall we get going? And I thought the best place to start is to possibly start with real life experience from people who um, who are having to do do the sort of difficult work and get this um, getting people around and about. So I'm going to ask Jigna to start and asking about um, some of the more practical issues. I mean, one of the, the, the thorns in everybody's side is, is the carne at the moment, um, just because they Historically, there were always carnets and you had to do them, but now they are much more complex and there's much more at stake, I suppose. So, Jigna, could you talk us through a little bit about maybe some of the implications around time and cost to do with carnets? So um, a carnet is effectively an official document that comes from the, cost, uh, the Chamber of Commerce. And what we need to do to get that in place is, especially for equipment, we have to make sure we have a list with all the equipment name, model number with the cost of it and everything else and um once you've sent that document through it takes about two or three days to get it back from the chamber of commerce now this is an official document that needs um there's a bond that you need to pay and that document basically allows us to take equipment out of the uk into the eu which has to be stamped and make sure that it comes back into the uh into the UK as well. So it is an immigration and customs issue. We have to make sure that that happens. So the timings are quite a lot because we have to make sure we have every piece of equipment accounted for. Um, and as you know, in events and filming, sometimes a request changes at the last minute. So that does mean that we're not allowed to add anything to, to that document. So we have to make sure up front we know exactly what we're taking. There's a contingency list that we need to have. Also, there's you know baggage, oversized baggage. We have to get all this through the port. So there's the time to get the carnet done, and then the cost of the carnet, which we can actually charge it back to the client. But for us, it's not just the cost of the carnet. It's the bond. You know, if you don't stamp it and you come back, there's another bond that may come out from HMRC, for example, that comes back to us. And then you also have to make sure that you have um, everyone educated to make sure that they know what this document needs to be done, where you need to check it, there's enough leaves in it. And, you know, some ports don't have that um, the customs people there. So you have to call and wait. And maybe it could be that in Heathrow, there's only two places and you have to phone them and say, oh, we're at Terminal 2. Oh, I need to go to Terminal 5. How do I get across? OK, you need to wait. So all the complexity of the time, effort and cost before you even leave the country is actually we have to think about on that front. And and I mean, you know, you, you're talking about the sort of the time there as well um, of in the moment. But the thing is, it, it's for small businesses. It's the time and resource taken within the office before you're even gone anywhere um, in, in completion, completing these forms. It's, it's, it can be days if somebody's inexperienced, days out of their schedule to make sure that this is correct and checked and everybody's got the right things and that they're, they're, they're confident that they're, that they're all in order. Um, if we could maybe go over to Rob or, or, or Arshad here, just to sort of possibly talk about um, what it is people need to look out for, what could they do to perhaps ease the path for this? Is there is there any way to round some of this? You know, what, what are some of the things that people need to look out for? Hi, Claire. Um, I, I've had some thoughts to that. Um, it, in, a, in a previous life, I've worked at Chambers of Commerce and I was, was heavily involved in issuing car now, so I've kind of seen it from, from both sides of the fence. And I think that there have been um, some efforts made in the last few years, especially to, to kind of digitize the process as much as possible, to automate the supply of information and all the data uh, at the item level, because that, that's crucial. Ultimately, we need that, that manifest to accurately represent what goods are going out. 
and then what they can check when those goods return. Now, I think it depends which um, Chamber of Commerce you're dealing with. You know, there's many of them across the UK, but you do have the Central Authority, the London Chamber, who, who offer a very efficient service uh, from what I've seen in terms of the, the online application. Um, they do offer some um, uh, template type setups that you can provide information a bit more quickly and then drop it in rather than manual entry you know single items but but crucially um it's all about identifying what what products are going out which ones are coming back and if there's any that's going to remain behind any consumables they also need to be documented in some way as well so additional invoices may need to be created uh, to account for these so um whatever's moving whether it's an export or an import that that accounting for those line items is crucial because ultimately the standard process is that those goods are subject to assessment for duty and VAT. So this is a, 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 an easement in effect, but we still would have provide that information. And I think ultimately it relies on the relationship you've got with the, the chamber that you're working with. And and perhaps Arshad, what, what about this situation that I think, um, you know, Jigda mentioned uh, when we were having an earlier discussion, when you move from, from different countries within, within the EU, um, so, and that if you're going in and out of, say, Switzerland, and then you come back into another European country, um, and I know that there can be some difficulties there because you're not, it's not like you're coming in and out of the UK into another country because they're, they're a block. That's right. Yes, uh, they are a block. And, and this is all, all comes back to preparation and planning. Um, and and, and, the, and the, the best tip we can give really is... Uh, plan your route, make sure you know the route that uh, you're going to be taking. Um, and on the internet, uh, you can, you have all the, uh, the the addresses of all the customs offices, uh, the transit offices, you have that there, it's readily available for uh, for our audience there to download and keep with them. Uh, and, and when you're going in and out of Switzerland, the advice is to, is to get it stamped in and, and out of that country, because I mean, it's outside of the EU block. Um, yes, it's part of the transit, uh, system but it's not part of the uh, customs union so the advice would be to make sure you you plan your route you have all the the uh, the customs uh, offices as you uh, and the transit offices and uh, and make sure the papers get stamped in, into and out of switzerland yeah and, and do we have we heard of any instances you know um, where people have been either turned away or fined i mean how so so as how rigid and strict is this all being at the moment is there some room for maneuver or 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 are because of course a lot of these countries themselves are probably trying to find their feet because they all have slightly different rules themselves i imagine so you know when we we talk about these bonds and you know is it having an impact financially yet when when people get it wrong jignan have you have you we haven't had foul of this yet. <laughs> we haven't had any bonds or any issues on like um, sanction bonds to be paid. However, the issue is that um, Europe isn't ready for carnets, from what we can tell from our team on the ground, because they are one block, and you can go to the smaller ports, and you'll you know it's very good to say okay, you need to know who the customs officer is, and we uh, you know we need to have that in pre-production and make sure the planning is there. But when you are physically at a port, be it an airport or even you know driving through Europe, for example, you know you, there's no way to stamp these documents. So when you're saying, "Oh, we need to know where people are," you can't account for it. So you're like, "Oh my God, I need to make sure this is done." But if there's no one physically there to do it, then the crew effectively are like taking a, "Do I stay? Do I wait? I have to get a flat plane. I need to get back." So it's all time consuming mm. and it's a cost to us as a small business or a big business or a medium sized business, because you have to take into account usually before we could get into Europe overnight and not have any issues. You know, we jump on a plane, we take our kit and we're there. Now we have to think, OK, we need to go get a carnet. We have to make sure that everyone stamps the right thing. We have to get it across the borders. We get it in and you arrive at some small country. You know, we were in Dunkirk, small port nothing is there how do you even get it stamped and the, and actually europe is not set up for carnets because they you know brexit has happened but the europeans are still working as you know the, the union is still working as one block so mm. they are not they think some people don't even know what a carnet is if you know in this in a port so we are worried 
that they and then implication is not on them it's going to be on us so we have to worry about making sure when we come back into the country we have it stamped officially say we've brought all the kit back that we have mm. Mm. And and what about um, um, again? Matt, this might be for Rob and Arshad. If if your brief changes suddenly, and and you do want to suddenly take some extra kit in or some extra camera light or lighting, or whatever, are there any um, ways round you could you could do that? I know you, you had mentioned temporary admission and duplicate lists. Is that what this re refers to when you you wanted to add things? So, so these are, are kind of special customs procedures. And if we just go back to the point about standard customs procedures, when we're moving our goods out of the UK and then into a third country, as, as all exports and imports are now, there will be a need for a customs declaration. So the carne means that you don't need to do that. So if we just think about the default, a customs declaration will need to be submitted. That requires working with a customs broker, and it may even require uh, some form of uh, fiscal representation and tax registration, possibly even company um, uh, set up in, in uh, you know, an EU member state. So that's the kind of default position. In the absence of that, we have these special procedures like the ATA Carne, which performs the role of a declaration. It does simplify that process. So without it, we would have to meet the formal requirements of a customs declaration. So that's much more difficult than what the carne could could offer. However, the special procedures that offer um, kind of similar benefits, which is ultimately goods moving in duty suspension from one place to another uh, in different different territories, uh, they can be utilised, um, but they would require management of uh, of, of data, uh, producing invoices, making sure those movements are documented, uh, and again, it may require that establishment of legal entities and, and, and at least uh, uh, fiscal representation and tax registrations in certain EU countries, if you're going to meet this process end to end. Um, now, an alternative to an ATA carne specifically, where either the destination doesn't accept a, a carne, it's not a party to the, to the convention, um, or if a carne proves to be cost prohibitive or, or it's, it's the timing and hassle of the application, the duplicate list is, is, a, is a kind of simple alternative but it works on the basis that a customs declaration is submitted uh, alongside this. And when the goods return, you have to ensure that the customs declaration contains the right information. So this, this requires the support and assistance of customs intermediaries. So that, although is a simplification or an alternative, it doesn't make the process any more simple. Claire, you're on mute. <laughs> Having warned you all, <laughs> I'm on mute. Um, Claire, we... can I just come in for a, a, a quick moment, if I may? Yes, yes, uh, I was. There, there is a, another option. Now, that this is not um, a, a, the Carnet way of doing things. This is more of an emergency route that uh, Rob and I did look at. That look, you know, if there is something last minute that you need to take. Uh, and this option is known as merchandise in baggage. Now, there is a, a, a very good comprehensive video on our .gov website that I'll share the link with you, and then we, you can, you have, you're welcome to share it with the, with the audience. That allows you to, as long as it's up to 1,500 pounds, less than 1,000 kilos, um, you, can, you can take it out with you. Uh, you'll need to do an invoice and a custom declaration you you will be expected to pay duty and VAT upon entry at, to the border, um, but then the challenge is 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 getting it back out and claiming and getting the refund back again. It's not an ideal option, I accept that. It's not a uh, the carne way of doing things. But if there was an emergency, you could have this uh, merchandise in baggage option, and we'll share the video with you. But it's a it's more of an emergency uh, way of doing things. Okay, but well, that's can good I just to know. mention that um, you say fifteen hundred pounds. That does anyone cover a lens, for example? Mm. So you know, there's you have to understand that what we're taking is 
not a cheap, it's, it's quite expensive, you know, cameras, mm. kit, lenses. So that's fine just to get taken something smaller, but that's not going to really help the bigger. No, you won't. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. So we just have to think about that. Mm. Yeah. Maybe it's his little cinematic camera. Anyway. Um, right. So sorry about that. That was my fault with the sound. Um, right. Uh, there is a question coming through about um, letters of intent. So I think at this point, if we can go to Samar and we'll, we'll come back to some of the, the, these other issues. But if we can go over to Samar to talk a little bit about... Um, visitors and eligibility and permitted activities it might actually answer this question but if not we'll we'll, we'll go to it directly um samar can you shed any light on what um people need to be aware of when having staff or crew or people moving around um europe now Sure. So um, I'll give an overview and then maybe uh, address the question uh, specifically. So um, because the UK has left the EU, uh, UK nationals who are traveling uh, to the EU as visitors, um, they fall under the trade and cooperation agreement. And there are provisions under the trade and cooperation agreement uh, allowing um, UK nationals to enter the EU as visitors for up to 90 days in any 180 day period. And I just want to uh, pause there for a second and explain a little bit about that in more detail because um, it is perhaps more restrictive than people realize. First of all, the 90 days will include both business and leisure travel. Okay, so it's about, um, you know, time spent as a business visitor or as a tourist in the EU. So UK employers who are sending their UK nationals over to the EU need to be aware of that, aware of you know, how much time their nationals have been spending um, in the EU. And you know, in, in today's day and age of remote working, and you know, uh, I understand there are even some Zoom filters that erase your tan. So, your employer doesn't know that you've actually been in South of France the whole time, um, that can be a bit tricky. So just something to be aware of. The limit is 90 days, and that's in any 180-day period. So that's calculated on a rolling basis. It's not like the first half of this calendar year and the next half of the calendar year. It's a rolling calculation. Okay. Now, there are some um, business activities that are permitted, but they are limited. So it's, a, you know, a lot of them are ones that you would expect, like business meetings, attending conferences, etc. One that's really in interesting um, for this industry, I think, is an allowance to um, install, uh, repair, um, or maintain equipment that's been leased um, to a European entity, for example. I think uh, that provision is probably, you know, the handiest uh, for this industry. So those um, activities are allowed, but the key thing is, well, the general rule is that you mustn't be paid, okay? You mustn't be paid from an, uh, from an EU source for your work, there and you shouldn't be selling things or services selling goods or services directly to the public there are exceptions um, to that general rule but that is the general rule um, so where your permitted where your planned activities do fall under the permitted activities then a letter um, of support is uh, definitely recommended um, and that would basically set out, um, you know, exactly what the individuals will be doing in the EU, exactly how their planned activities fall under the permitted activities, that they have um, sufficient um, funds to maintain themselves during the trip, uh, et cetera. And that's definitely recommended. Now, from what, just to address the question specifically, uh, the question that's come through in the chat relates to people going to Germany from the UK to direct a shoot. Um, and that would not 
necessarily be covered by any of the business activities. And so um, really, you might be looking at obtaining a type of work visa in Germany if these are UK nationals going there. Um, and there are work visa types that also fall under the trade and cooperation agreement having to do with contractors um, or independent professionals. Um, but it does it is more complicated than just um, presenting a letter of intent at the border, for example, to facilitate entry in that instance. It always is more complicated, isn't it? <laughs> um, there's another question here from Liam. Um, working visas are required for individuals to work in the EU and that the rules differ between countries. Um, taking crew becomes problematic. You also have to prove that you cannot employ people locally to do the same job. Um, what advice can you give on visas where it, for te technical and creative teams? You know, that, that whole idea of proving that the team you've got with you are the only people who could do that job because of the creative uh, intent or, 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 or IP around it. Um, you know, is there anything that has been specifically set up that would cater to the more creative industries on this? Um, so unfortunately, there's very little provision. Basically, you know, the trade and cooperation agreement um, came into effect when about you know a year ago everybody was still um, locked down uh, you know significantly and so it kind of didn't matter at the time basically we were shielded from brexit by covid um, and unfortunately it's now that things are starting to bite people are waking up to the fact that it it, it is kind of incredibly difficult one thing i would say is that um, you know, it's worth looking at what activities are planned and in which jurisdictions on a case by case basis, because there is often more that is allowed than one would um, than one would expect or imagine. But it's a matter of finding that window to push, you know, to push your individuals through, to push your employees through. Um, in the relevant jurisdiction, but it's, it is specific to each country now. I know um, there was something that came through um, about work permit free routes for musicians and performers. Um, I, I don't know whether any of, of that can, can, can be used for some of our, our type of activity, or is that very specific, do you know? Sorry, Samar, that was a question for, for you. Sorry, I was having some technical issues with my screens. Um, yeah, so uh, there is there was an announcement um, by the Department for Culture, Media, uh, Digital Culture, Media and Sport. Sport yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, about some uh, visa-free touring allowed. Now, I'm not sure. I think it's a bit of a um, it's it's a bit of false news because um, it's specific to some countries. Uh, you know, it, and it does include some of the main ones, but it doesn't. It's not EU wide, for example. But it is some countries um, in the EU, and the the government seems to have announced it like, oh, we've negotiated this great deal. Um, but actually it is uh, fairly limited both in the, um, the jurisdictions to which it applies and the activities. So, you know, a lot of the issue that I understand um, touring, it, touring uh, companies are having is that, you know, some people can enter. So maybe the creatives can enter, the musicians can enter, but there's so many more people involved in the tour, aren't there? Um, and how are you going to get all of them there and from one country to the next, you know, over 12 countries? It's, it's that that's really tricky. So without a kind of 
more holistic um, framework for the industry. It's these types of bits and pieces are of limited value. Okay, I mean it's interesting. There's a few points coming through on the on the chat that you know it 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 might be worth sometimes you know almost changing how you represent yourself as to what you're going to do. That you you're not there as the director, you're there as a an observer or a delegate or a um, and then and then seeing if if one can get round it that way. I mean, you know, I, I do think it is just slightly the wild west out there until until things settle down and and everyone finds finds ways um, to, to, to do this. Um, it, did you, um, we, we'll move on from people in a minute and go back to some of the, um, the, the kit stuff, but were there any variations in things around Schengen visas? Is, is there a, is it, you know, I know that there's sort of like different bodies and different groups, but is, is there anything worth adding about that before, before we move on? Um, sure. Well, I'll just take a step back for those who aren't familiar with Schengen. Um, so Schengen is um, a membership or block within the EU that includes uh, many EU countries, but not all of them. Um, and um, it, a non-UK national um, may require a Schengen visa to enter the EU for, uh, again, up to 90 days in uh, any 180 days. It is very similar to the kind of uh, business visitor activities in terms of the permitted activities, um, but there are there are variations. Um, so uh, Claire, you and I were discussing, I think yesterday, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Croatia, Cyprus, they are not actually uh, full fully uh, signed up to the Schengen Aki, even though they are um, EU members. So there are some variations there. And I think that's why those countries were highlighted to you earlier. Um, and then there are also some quite, you know, there are just particularities as there always are in immigration um, rules in that, you know, some countries, nationals that you wouldn't expect to be exempted are. Um, so for example, Colombian nationals um, have certain allowances uh, in the Schengen area. So again, it's always just worth looking at the facts specifically. It's just that logistically that becomes quite difficult if you're dealing with a whole um, you know, team or tour or everybody involved in a shoot. Um, one of the other points that was just shared with me as well by somebody else I was having a conversation with from uh, Ashfield events is to be very aware of the new regulations about passports um, and the grace period that you have when something, when your passport is due to expire. Um, you used to be given a lot more latitude um, when you, or when you ordered a new passport, if you ordered one, you know, 10 months before it was due, you kept that 10 months and, and it would all add on. Apparently this doesn't happen anymore. And if you are going into a country, you absolutely have to have six months remaining on a passport. Um, otherwise uh, it might be invalid. And if you are uh, caught out like this, you could be liable for a one year entry ban into that specific country. And this uh, responsibility all sits with the, um, with the individual traveller. Um, they also suggested that there is a good uh, website you could look at, which um, helps you calculate short stay visas. Um, and we'll put this in the um, resource list at the end of the, the event, but that might come in handy just to help you out for short stay stuff. Um, so uh, Rob and uh, Arshad, have you got any suggestions of how people can keep up to date with changing regulation, because it does seem that this is this is a constantly moving, evolving um, state. And are, are there any helpful uh, places to go to be constantly updated? Yeah, definitely. I think that you know, there's a lot that you can um, uh, find on Gov UK. I mean, it kind of goes without saying now, but um, I think to cut between all of that because it is kind of written and producing a bit of a uh, non-operational sense. Um, so I think speaking with us, uh, our team at the Institute of Export, we can 
talk with you about the, the different requirements and the different options you have. And, and, you know, going back to the alternative to a carno, the duplicate list, you know, we can talk to you about how you actually prepare that process, um, how you produce the documentation to support it and how you work with intermediaries to make it happen. Um, the legal requirements there and the obligations um, are going to be fairly similar to anyone exporting. So, so we're a good place to come to talk to you about that. Um, well, I think that you can sign up to um, notifications from GovUK as well on export and import matters. Um, so where there's any changes or developments around um, schemes such as temporary admission, for example, uh, and even the ATA Carnet scheme, you'll receive that information you know, in fairly, fairly real time. Um, so that would be a, you know, a good, good place to start. Okay, thank you. I just want to say, I mean, it's from a practical perspective, there's a lot of information. Um, there's a lot of education that's needed and clear to the point that you made before that, you know, people in a, an agency that's working day to day on this, this just is adding extra time, effort, also knowing what is changing constantly. And that is going to be quite difficult. And as you know, a people, few people in the chat have said, going into Europe to do work is just like, it's going to be this, you know, the people, the kit, the process, everything is just making it very difficult. And there's implications of, you know, it's on the responsibility of the individual traveling on the passport, the 180 days, 90 days for the 180 days rolling. And, you know, visas, not visas. There's such a barrage of information out there that it's not, it's not just one place we can find out all this information and going to the website gov.uk is great, but there's still layers that you need to walk through to get to that information. And it's, if you miss something, then that is gonna really cause real issues going down the line for just for that event, for example. So we just need yeah. to be, it's gonna be quite difficult for everyone, I think. I mean, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, this is a part of the reason why we're hoping to keep a resource um, uh, page ourselves. We're going to be working more closely with the Institute of Export to be able to provide a sort of Q&A service um, to hopefully be able to cut through some of that because I, I absolutely I think it's going to have a, 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 a very detrimental impact on some of the smaller agencies who just really struggle to find the bandwidth to, to do this stuff and also it's a skill set you know looking through legal documents figuring out the right path to take is, is is not everybody's forte so it's having somebody on site or on side who can help you with that stuff is really important and also I think everybody needs to really start thinking about how to educate our clients because um, if, if you're working with European clients it's, it's really really important that we keep them on side that we keep them supportive and understanding um, be, because there is that worry that it all just becomes too difficult and and I think we need to find ways of sort of dampening that idea down that that we keep that sort of can do attitude and and try and find ways around it um but it's also I think making sure that we put in place processes right from the early start of any project so that these things might be covered off as you're going rather than having to do it all in one go towards the end but um you know, I think one of the things we did discuss and, you know, we could maybe have a sort of a more of a general discussion here is about this, how this impacts on the agility of a company to respond to um, a job or, or a brief from a client. You know, as as Jigna had referred to at the beginning of her her conversation that, you know, there was a time when you could just jump on a plane and go the next day to reshoot something or, or um, you know, to cover something that's you know, the time was right, um, and 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 now that is sorely impacted. Um, has anybody found that that has uh, been difficulty yet? I'm sort of talking to the audience. You know, maybe you'd like to share stories of, you know, when you have been hampered, and is there a way around that? I know some companies have set up uh, offices in Europe. Do, do is there another way around making sure that we can keep agile for our clients. Jigna, do you have any thoughts on that at all? I think we are working with local companies to try and help us navigate this world and 
building our suppliers across um, Europe um, at the moment. We do have Brunswick Creative, uh, we have got Brunswick offices um, locally, but sometimes it's the skill set, as you say, the creatives, the technicals, which may not be there. And we haven't really come across that um, at the moment where we're, you know, finding local people within Europe in our, our team. So we are looking to suppliers at the moment, but it still is headed through the London team because the creatives are majority, you know, we, we work through from the London office. So we haven't worked that far ahead on what's going to happen on the ground as yet. But um, I think there's going to be thought, food for thought about how we address and fulfill our clients' requirements um, in Europe going forward. And there's a lot of thinking behind the scenes that need to happen. And I think to your point, um, I think Samara's point is that COVID has shielded us from Brexit. And we are now working our way through the system. And actually there's so many things that we haven't really thought about or we don't know what's happening. So no, I think I don't think we, we are there yet. I don't think we have got a workaround. Um, I think the workaround is let's try to get our people on the ground and try and educate, you know, if there's anyone we can work with locally, that's the best way forward for us. Um, but that's not ideal because there's also compliance and complexities in that. And I know, I know one of the things you talked about as well was, was you know, reputational management. You know, if, if you're walk, working with uh, crews from other countries that you've never used before and um, uh, suppliers and teams, you haven't had that opportunity to build up relationships with yet so sometimes it's just a bit of a shot in the dark and you know um clients can be particularly sensitive depending on who they are uh, about who they work with and, and agreements signed and so forth so these are all things to be thinking about and uh, jeremy i do see your point about who's going to put the processes in and when you know it it is going to be a hit for a lot of um companies and it you know it might be that long term it, it's almost will require a restructure in some organizations so that you are hiring um people who can work on this um in the long term i mean i know that's not a short-term solution um and as i said we as an organization and association will be trying to gather some of this information ourselves now and sharing it with our members in easily digestible um in ways um but you know as as been mentioned you know we, we've sort of taken our eye off the ball on brexit because we've been trying to survive through the pandemic so every, i think everybody it's an opportunity in a way for our sector to where possible to try and help each other and offer shared experiences and advice and we did this they did that we tried that that didn't work and pool this information together and, 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 and try and move forward with it. Um, just before we, we maybe move on to have a look at some of the other questions, I'm trying to keep an eye on those as well. Um, ju I just wanted to flag up some of the other, not wanted to be doom and gloom, but some of the other issues that have been brought to my attention, just in case you aren't aware. Things like um, the eHIC card and insurance, uh, which is being replaced by the GHIC card, which is the global health insurance. This is for your individual team members traveling. Um, but that doesn't cover all countries. So the GHIC card doesn't cover Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein or Switzerland. So bear that in mind. Uh, for those event uh, companies that often send out um, gifts to delegates or speakers, um, there are certain couriers now that will not offer this service if they're food packages uh, because it's too complicated for them as the courier. Um, so you need to try and find a supplier that will do that for you or don't send food parcels or rethink your gifting. Um, drivers, uh, it, that's individual drivers rather than your heavy goods. Um, you need to have your green paper license with you now. Um, and obviously, I'm sure we're all aware of the phone one um, and the promise early days that we weren't going to be charged roaming uh, charges. And now that is starting to shift. So please be aware of that with your staff members. Um, so I wondered if we could um, just maybe look at some of the other questions here that have come through, sort of um, the timing issues. Uh, Andrew is talking about the timing issues and tighter deadlines. 
again, I think this is um, uh, an issue that will be all about the planning. As, as Arsha had alluded to, planning is tantamount um, more so than ever. I know we're all, anybody who works in events and film are masters of planning, um, but it's going to become more and more um, of a, an issue. Um, so that I don't rabbit on any more, can I just um, go round the, the, the group just to see if I could ask you each to maybe flag one or two more points before we, we 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 close in about five or ten minutes, I'll start from the other end. So, um, Arshad, could I ask you if you have any anything further that you would like to offer or advise on at this point? Um, to just to re uh, well, um, in terms of information sources, we've got the Institute of Export website. There's the DIT website on the .gov. The chambers um, have some information as well. They have certain pages on different sectors of industry that could help you. Um, and, uh, and we have a helpline as well, so that you could ring that and uh, uh, pose some questions to our panel of experts there. So really in terms of in information, those are the three areas, four areas that I would suggest you, you keep eye on. The .gov website is as legislation and easements and or introduced are updated quite regularly and, and, and fairly often. So that would be really the anchor point and, and the others can support it. Thank you. And I know the um, the Gov website, you can put in your details and you will get automatic updates yes, and reminders, yes. I believe. Mm. So um, right. it saves you having to go and look for them every mm. time you will get, they will get flagged to you as and when they arrive. Um, Rob, anything further to add? Um, yeah, a couple of things. Um, I, I think, Really importantly, you raised the issue around food movement. So the food products are subject to additional health controls um, for exports to the EU since last year. They've been uh, in place since January, since day one. They've been, in, been enforced in full, and that's made exports of food kind of stop overnight for some companies, unfortunately. The other way into the UK, we're still introducing those controls. So we have to think about this. And again, it's back to planning and, and, and identifying the route, what's going to happen and where do we check those controls? So there's some tools available to understand what your products are subject to, what kind of tariffs they're, they're going to be subject to as well. So making use of the UK trade tariff, the lookup tool, um, but also the market access database uh, for EU imports is a great resource because it will tell you what conditions uh, apply to your goods when they arrive um, tariffs uh, all included and also um, considerations around rules of origin um, some very good step-by-step -step, uh, guidance in there in, in effect it's a self-assessment tool so those two things i would definitely recommend uh, companies to take a look at we are exporters or importers no matter how we look at it and so we, we've got to try to um, uh, embrace this uh, additional requirement but also in the long term this is only going to enhance trade further afield and mm. uh, it will help with those efforts uh, for the rest of the world as well okay thank you thank you um samar anything that um further we can we can take from your um knowledge and experience so i would just summarize to give people a kind of plan of how to approach this um Consider your team members and whether any of their potential activities could be covered off by the permitted business activities. You know, um, Andrew was saying it's difficult because you need your UK team to install the assets. Well, that might be an activity that's actually covered under the permitted activities for business visitors under the trade and cooperation agreement, this maintenance and installation activity that's allowed. Um, and then um, consider as well, you know, educating clients in specific jurisdictions. Let's say, you know, you work a lot with certain clients, look into the possibilities in those jurisdictions of having the support of the client for um, more formal work visa types. So again, under the trade and cooperation agreement, there are um, work visas for um, contractual service suppliers that could apply. And the way, the way the UK has implemented that is to have the client basically sponsor the employees of the contractors 
contracting service. So it might work similarly in many EU countries, definitely worth looking into. And I can put people in touch with other advisors. The other thing I would consider is something that you touched on, Claire, which is that the individual bears a risk. And I would just like to um, make a plea for people to take care of their employees because not only can they be banned on the basis of those passport issues that you described, but if they um, work in an EU country without authorization, um, you know, there can be uh, financial penalties and even criminal penalties. Um, you know, that's not very nice. In terms of resources, there are really good country guides on gov.uk. Um, when you're signing up for um, updates, I would just say make sure you cover off all the potential um, departments that would apply. So, for example, the DC, DCMS uh, announcement, I might never get it, but you know what I mean. Um, you know, that might um, that might have passed me by because I'm so obsessed with the home office. So just make a note of that. That would be my tip. Thank you very much. Um, and Jigna, can we end with you, please? Um, I think um, it's going to come back to, for me, is uh, planning, making sure there's enough contingency for the team and budget and making sure that we have um, enough covered. So for eventualities of um, every step has been covered with some sort of buffer for, for your team, just because there will be unexpected delays or timings. And I think once you've got that planning phase to a point where you think actually you've got everything in place is documenting for that team are educated enough to understand that actually this is the pitfalls, this is what they need to look out for and making sure they're confident enough to understand what they need to do on the, on the, gr on the ground when they go out. So for us, it's a very practical uh, perspective of getting the team out with all the information they need and giving them enough buffer time to sort of make sure that they can, you know, tick box, check, make sure everything's at every point is checked out. And um, I think supporting from the, you know, from, from the London office or, you know, wherever you're based is giving that the support and check in to make sure that that's all covered on the ground. And I think my second point is um, finding a backup of suppliers in local countries, because um, especially for equipment, because you just don't know. And that's something that we, you know, it's, it's, taking something out from the UK when they're on the ground is not going to be going to happen. So just having that sort of, you know, working with local people, local suppliers and building that rapport for your, you know, for your team to say, you know what, we will have somebody around should you need it because it's mm -hmm. going to happen or it's, you know, for any eventuality. So planning and making sure you know what you, you know, what to expect while you're on, on the ground. Yeah, great tips there. And I think the the, the emphasis on, on, you know, having a duty of care for your employees who are out there <laughs> dealing with this when they, when they reach the borders is, is, is a really good one. Do we just have time quickly, Samar, just to, to cover off Ian um, McGinty's question there about if it's a UK crew and it's a UK company and they're being paid in the UK, but the thing is in Europe? Um would they be able to go and film in the EU under general permitted business activities? Yeah, so unfortunately, no, there isn't a business activity, um, a permitted business activity that covers that, um, that activity uh, that applies there. Um, the one about installation, repair and maintenance, um, I think some training is allowed under that. So maybe there's some wiggle room where you're sending somebody to train somebody else to use it. Uh, but it, again, it's, it's, you know, it's bitty. It's not really sufficient. It's not really a, um, a, a comprehensive answer. And I see Jeremy's asked for the list of permitted business activities. That's basically in the trade and cooperation agreement. Um, I'll just warn you um, that it's a very hairy document. And, um, they all. and there are lots of uh, derogations. So each country um, within uh, the EU and the UK have um, specified, you know, certain bits of the agreement they're not signing up to or um, further restrictions on certain activities, etc. cetera. Um, but that's where the list is. 
And and mm -hmm. where, where can that be found? Is there a website or um the trade and cooperation agreement? Mm -hmm. If you if you Google um EU UK trade and cooperation agreement, which is the official title, although the U the gov.uk um website calls it UK EU, but um <laughs> UK trade and cooperation agreement, it should come up. Um, I'd say make sure you're looking at the PDF so you have the full and actual agreement. But honestly, I wouldn't, I would not, um, I wouldn't recommend people wading into that on their own. Without... It could be a bit of bedtime reading for you, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, on, on, on that rather disheartening note, um, we, we, we'll, we'll, we'll call it a, a day. Um, I would like to thank our lovely panel. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult subject. It's, it, it, it's one that um, people are really struggling with, but I'm, I'm hoping that the help and advice you've provided will at least send people in the right direction and we'll post as much of this onto our website as possible so that people can refer to it. So um, uh, Jigna, Samar, uh, Rob and Arshad, thank you all very much. And thank you to our lovely um, attendees. I hope it was of some help. We will keep running these. Um, I think we've only scratched the surface. There's lots of other avenues we can go down. Um, before I go, just to flag our next event, always got to do a bit of selling. Um, we have uh, an in real life campfire event on the 23rd of March um, entitled, Is There Actually a Talent Shortage? And that is Rob Kenwood from The, um, the Hub who will be talking through that and um, trying to dispel that myth. Okay, thank you all very much once again and we hope to see you soon. And big thanks to our panel. Thank you very much. And then the webinar.